preaching tonight, I want them to acknowledge different points. And the very first point that I want you to acknowledge is I want you to acknowledge in a real sense, in a legitimate sense, that there is a, a real spiritual battle that is going on. There is a real, legitimate, spiritual war that is taking place. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter number 6. Now please keep your hand there if you haven't dropped it already in Luke chapter number 22. Luke chapter number 22 where we began here. And then uh, if you have a piece of paper, maybe the bulletin could uh, be utilized for that purpose. I want you to go, as I said, to Ephesians chapter number 6. I want everyone to understand and acknowledge that there is a real spiritual battle. There is a real spiritual war. There is pure goodness or righteousness, which is, of course, the Lord. It comes from the Lord. It's the Spirit of God, right? But then there is also pure evil. There is, of course, Satan, who is, you know, a pure evil manifest. And there is this battle that's going on between these two sides, right? You know, the Lord represents the one side, the side of goodness. You know, he's the head or the general, if you will, of the righteous army. But then over here you have the army of unrighteousness. You have the devil. You have the Satan. You have Satan. You have these two sides that, are, that could not be more uh, uh, polar opposites. They are 100% opposite of one, uh, one another. You have goodness and you have unrighteousness. You have, you know, purity and you just have filthiness. And there is a war that is going on, a spiritual battle between these two sides every day since the beginning of time. Between these two sides there has been a battle between goodness, between right, and between wrong. That's the very first point that I want you to acknowledge this evening. I want you to look with me at Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 10. The Bible says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now look at verse number 12. Now he's going to tell you why. So he, he, just, he just spoke to you as if you are a soldier, as if you need to prepare for battle, as if you need to be prepared for an attack. Then he says this in verse number 12, for, that means because, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So I want you to notice that you are warned there. You're, you're first warned that you need to prepare yourself. You need to put on the whole armor of God as if you are going out to battle, as if you are going out to war, as if you are going out to fight. And then he tells you why. He tells us specifically that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And then he says this, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible teaches that there is a real battle going on between right and wrong. A spiritual, you know, there is spiritual warfare taking place. A spiritual war that is going on between God and the devil. Between those that are the children of God and those that are the children of the devil. Between the good and between the evil. And we need not to be naive of this. Oftentimes people will just think that everything is good in life. That, that, that there is no battle going on. That you know, there's just many people that are confused, right? And just everybody's just, just confused. Now, of course, a lot of people fall into that category, but there are a lot of people out there that are working for Satan. You know, there are a lot of people out there that are Satan's minions. There are a lot of people out there that, that want to do harm, and, and Satan manifests or encapsulates all of that. Satan himself is the exact opposite of God, and, and what he wants to do is he wants to destroy. He is your enemy. He is your enemy. Now, whether or not you are engaging in warfare against him or not, that's irrelevant because he's engaging against you. And he's fighting against you and he's battling against you. So that's the first point that's going to uh, you know, uh, set the stage for the sermon this evening is I want you to acknowledge this evening the simple truth that there is a spiritual war. That there is a real battle that is going on where there is evil that wants to harm the good. I want you to go now back to Luke chapter number 22. Hopefully you kept your place. So I'll give you a, a little bit more time to find it if you, if you did not, if you dropped the page. Luke chapter number 22. And the very second point actually is derived from verse number 31. And it's also the title of the sermon. It says this in verse number 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, speaking to Peter, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. That statement right there, I want you to, to, to notice that statement. 
He's warning Simon. He's warning Peter. And he says this, Satan hath desired to have you. Now, as I mentioned, whether or not you're engaging in warfare against Satan is irrelevant. Because there is a real battle or there is a real war and there is a real Satan, a real adversary, a real devil that is out there. And do you know what he wants? He wants to have you. And, you know, a lot of people, they read the Bible and they don't apply it to themselves oftentimes. They won't, they, 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 they won't uh, you know, kind of put themselves in that situation or maybe they won't allow the Bible to speak to them and they don't realize when the Bible is talking to them and when it does apply to them. But let me make it very, very clear, extremely clear this evening that every single person, saved believers that are in this room, Satan desires to have you. Right. Satan desires to have you. Not only that, of course, your children, those that are innocent, those that you know, have not been you know, uh, uh, corrupted or things along those lines that haven't already been brought over to Satan's side, Satan desires to have them. So we need to keep this in mind. and We need to be cognizant of the fact that Satan desires to have me. Satan is looking for an opportunity where he can have you. Now I want you to go with me to 1 Peter chapter number 5 verse number 8 and that's the second point. First I want you to acknowledge that there is a real spiritual war that is going on. There's a real spiritual battle that is taking place between good and evil. There's a fight that's going back and forth and there are people out there that want to harm you. But not only that, I want you to understand the seriousness of it, that there is a supernatural creature that was created that has power that is, is, that is not a fool. You know, the Bible talks about Jesus, talks about being wise as a serpent, right? So what does that tell you about a serpent? That serpents are wise, doesn't it? When you, when you, when you, when you actually uh, analyze uh, Scripture and, you, and, you, and you, you look at and study Satan, Satan is not stupid. Satan deceives people because he's intelligent, because he's smart. There are wiles that he has. There are devices that he has. And he is very deceptive. He's very wise. And this supernatural creature that has these powers, he desires to have you. And he's working to try to harm or hurt you. Now, in Luke chapter number 22, I actually forgot to point out one other point. You can, you can stay there in 1 Peter chapter number 5. That's fine, so you don't have to keep turning back and forth. But in Luke chapter number 22, there was one point that I wanted to make before we look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Luke, uh, Luke chapter number 22, we have the statement that's made to Simon, the warning, where he tells him, Satan hath desired to have you. Now, you think about that. You think, what does he mean that he desires to have me? Obviously, Peter was the Lord's. Peter was, was saved, right? So he's, in what way did he desire to have Peter, right? Because obviously he already belongs to the Lord in that sense. His soul is already sealed and saved. You know, he's, he's eternally secure. So in what way, you know, does, does Satan desire to have a Christian? In what way does Satan desire to have or possess a Christian? What does he want to do? Well, Jesus says this afterwards. He says, that he may sift you as wheat. So notice he says that he may sift you as wheat. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with the process of, of threshing or sifting wheat. But basically what it is is the sifting of wheat is where you are separating the grain, which is what is useful, which is what is actually used, from the chaff. You're separating when the whole thing, well, oftentimes you refer to as wheat, right? But the grain is particularly the product that you are going to use. But then there's also a lot of trash, a lot of the chaff, like the stalk, that's not used. That's waste. A lot of it is waste. A lot of it is, it's, it's referred to as refuse, right? You're refusing to use it. It's reprobate. It's rejected. You don't need it, right? So he's saying that, that what he wants to do is he wants to sift you as wheat. Now, how do you sift wheat? You know what you do is you tear it apart. You know what you do is you rip it up. You rip it apart or you tear it apart. Another way to refer to it is you devour it. That is how you sift it. You have to separate the two. They're one, and you actually have to tear them apart or beat them apart or rip them apart. So what actually Jesus is warning Simon is that Satan hath desired to have you. Now what does he mean by that? He wants you in, in, in the sense that he wants to tear you apart. Or he wants to have you in the sense that he wants to rip you apart. What does he mean by that? He wants to devour you. He wants to destroy you. What Satan desires to do, and I want this to sink down into your ears because this is a real warning this evening from the Bible. Satan wants to destroy your life. 
Satan wants to destroy your life. He wants to get you out of the Christian life. That's what he wants to do. There's a battle going on and what he wants you is to be off the field. He doesn't want you to be involved in the battle that is being fought. He wants to get rid of one soldier at a time. That's what he wants to do. He wants to remove one soldier at a time. So what he's going to do is he's going to try to sift you as wheat. He's going to try to destroy you or he's going to try to devour you or tear you apart just like you would tear wheat apart. You would sift wheat. I want you to look with me here at 1 Peter chapter number 5 and show you the consistency of this. Look with me at verse number 8. It says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So I want you to look at Excuse me, Satan's objective. I want you to look at what the devil's objective from 1 Peter chapter number 5 is. What does he say that Satan is doing? It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walketh about as a, or I'm sorry, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. What does he want to do? He's looking for the opportunity just to devour someone. What his actual objective is, is he is walking around just like how a lion will, you know, uh, prance around or will walk around and prowl around and look for something. What are they looking for? They're looking for something that they can devour. They're looking for something that they can tear apart. They're looking for something that they can destroy. You need to understand there's a supernatural cr uh, creature out there that is looking for the opportunity where he can destroy your life. He's looking for the opportunity where he can tear your life apart. He wants to remove you from the fight. He wants to remove you from the battle. He wants to get rid of you and he wants to get you out of the way. Now, he's not trying to fight against false religions. Satan's not trying to fall against, f fight against false religions. Why? Because he already has them. They're already his. He's not fighting against them. He's, you know, they're already on his side, right? And you say, well, prove it. Well, the Bible tells us, if Satan be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? So he's not fighting against his own religions. Those are all Satan's religions, right? It's either Christ and then everything else is Belial. That's what it is. Right. Everything else is Satan. Everything else is the devil's religion. So he's not fighting against his own kingdom. He's not fighting against his own you know, uh, 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 soldiers and all those on his uh, uh, side. Obviously, he hates them. He already has them. He's already brought them into it. So he's not going to continually battle against them. But who he wants to battle against is Christians. Who he wants to battle against is those that are in the fight against him. And even more so, I want you to think about this. And this is going to be point number three. I want you to think about this. Why specifically did Jesus specify Peter? Why did he specify Peter? What was the reason why he pointed out Peter? And the reason being is because Peter was more so of a threat. Now I want you to uh, you know, imagine that you put yourself in Satan's shoes. And I want you to think about from his perspective what makes the most sense. If you were Satan and your goal is defeat, de, to defeat your enemy, your enemy is Christianity, your enemy is all of those that are saved believers, all of those that are engaged in the spiritual warfare to some degree. They're at least enlisted in the army because they're saved. Let's say that. Who are you going to go after? Are you going to go after the new convert, the guy that just got saved maybe this afternoon who Brother Hall led to the Lord? Is that going to be your primary concern? Or are you going to go after maybe a godly man that's been, that's, that's been see, uh, serving the Lord for many years and is getting hundreds of, you know, yay, thousands of people saved through a big, large ministry? Who are you going to go after? You know what you would do is you would go after the largest threat. That's what you would go after. You would go after the one that's the biggest threat to you or the one that could cause the most damage or the one that could get the biggest advantage over you. You know, in, a, in, in a military tactics, obviously, if one army is attacking the other, what they're going to try to do is to take out what is the biggest threat to them. They're going to try to remove the most effective soldiers from the army that they're battling against. That, you know, they're not going to go after people that aren't, you know, if they find out that there's a sniper that's picking off a bunch of people in the back, what are they going to do? Make sure we take the sniper out. That's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to look and try to find out what's the biggest threat. Who is the biggest threat to us? So why did Jesus specify Peter? Because he was the biggest threat to him. He knew that Jesus, you know, Satan uh, wanted Peter specifically because Peter was more of a threat. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that Satan would want to destroy or to tear apart Peter, because Peter was more of a threat. So if you want to, this is point number three. 
If you plan on serving the Lord with your life, if you want to do big things for God, you need to expect to be at the top of Satan's hit list. You need to understand and acknowledge and know right now, before you get you know, too far into this, you need to already know and be aware that your life is not just going to be daisies and rainbows and unicorns. You need to understand that it's not just going to be this perfect fairy tale. No Christian in the Bible lives a life like that, so you shouldn't expect to either. It's just affliction after affliction coming from Satan. And that's what we should expect. If you in your life, you say, I want to do big things for God. I want to serve God with all that I have. Then you need to know that you're going to be at the top of his hit list. You need to know that it, in that case, what you're going to be is a big threat to the devil. You know what he's going to do? is He's going to, he's going to concentrate more of his efforts on you. He's going to concentrate more of his time on you. If there's a church that's making a big impact, you know what he's going to do? He's going to concentrate a lot of his efforts on that church. If there's a church that he can see is you know, growing and and, 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 and building and, and working forward and doing more and more works, you know what he's going to do? He's going to concentrate a lot of his efforts on that church. If there's a church maybe that's doing a lot of soul winning, you know, we, we try to, you know, that's very important to us here at the church. We try to do a lot of soul winning. You know what he's going to do? He's going to try to take one soldier out of the field at a time. He's going to try to pick off the biggest threats starting at the top. Whoever's doing the most work, whoever's the biggest threat to him, he's going to try to remove them from the battle and try to remove them from the field. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter number 5, look at verse number 9. It says this, Whom, referring to the devil, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So notice he says the same afflictions. What afflictions? The afflictions that they're going through as Christians. And notice other Christians are going through them as well. Why? Because the devil's attacking them. Because the devil is going about as a roaring lion. He's walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you are serving God, if you're a Christian, he wants to devour you. If you are serving God, he even more so wants to devour you. He wants to remove you from the fight. So you need to be aware of that. This is something you, you need to know your enemy and you need to know that there's somebody out there that's trying to hurt you. If you found out that there was a person that was trying to seek after you and to kill you, wouldn't you, be, wouldn't you want to be aware of that? Wouldn't you want somebody to come and tell you and warn you about that? If you knew that there was a person that's saying, hey, I'm going to kill him. Brother Rick Martinez, you know, I'm going out and I've been hired and I'm a hit man. Wouldn't you want to know that, Brother Rick? You'd want to be aware of that. Well, that's why the Bible warns us about that. That there's a real devil out there. There's a real adversary, Satan, that's going about it. You know what he's doing? He's looking for opportunities in your life. He's looking for opportunities where he can tear us apart, where he can devour us and destroy us. I want you to go to the book of Job and see this again and, and see this consistency in the book of Job. The book of Job. <clears throat> Whoops. Right before the book of Psalms. Book of Job. Go to specifically Job chapter number 1. Job chapter number 1. I want you to look at verse number 7. Verse number 7, it says this, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? It means, where did you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Does that sound familiar? What did 1 Peter 5, 8 say that Satan was doing? He said, He walketh about as a roaring lion, looking, looking for whom he may devour. Look at what it says next. Verse number 8, watch this. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? So what did the Lord know of why he was walking about in the earth? Do you know what he was doing? Do you know why he was going to and fro in the earth and walking around in the earth? Satan, that is. He was looking for a person to devour. And you know what the Lord said? He said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Because God already knew what he was doing. God knew what Satan's plan is, what it, his objective is. He knew why he was walking around. You know what he was doing? I want you to think about that. He was looking for someone. He's trying to find someone. He's looking for the opportunity of a Christian, of someone that's serving God, that loves the Lord, that's in the fight, that's, you know, that's maybe causing harm to his kingdom, that's hurting his kingdom and affecting his kingdom in a negative way. And you know what he's doing? He's trying to find that person so he can take them out of the battle. He's trying to find that person so he can hurt them and remove them and injure them. That's what he's doing. And you know what the Lord did? He offered something enticing to him. What did he say? Hast thou considered my servant Job? Who did he offer? He offered Job 
Look at verse 1. There was a man in the, lame, in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. The Bible highly esteems Job. Talks about Job in a very great way in his Christianity. Lifts him above all those in the earth at that time. And do you know what the Lord knew? The Lord knew that that would be appealing to Satan. He knew that that would be enticing to Satan. Do you know why? Just like why Satan, the same reason why Satan wanted to tear Peter apart. Why? Because he was a threat. Because he knew that Job was more of a threat to Satan. And he knew that Satan would be enticed by that and would want to take him out of the battle. She so says further in verse number uh, uh, 8 there, it says, Hast thou considered my, jo my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. I want you to turn with me now, go with me now to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 11. So why did he offer Job to him again? Because he was a threat. The same reason why Jesus singled out Peter and Jesus knew that Satan would want to destroy Peter. What was the reason? Because he knew he was a bigger threat. Who was the greatest of all the uh, apostles or the disciples? Peter, for sure. Paul, of course, came along and did great works uh, uh, as far as the numbers and everything. But if we look at Peter in the early uh, uh, stages of the book of Acts, I mean, people are, he's healing people and people just want his shadow to pass by so that it would heal them. He's doing great things. He's obviously the leader of the, of the disciples and of the apostles. You can see that even why Jesus walks on the earth. That it's Jesus and then, you know, as far as it goes of the twelve apostles, that Peter's next. So why would Satan want to just choose out Peter? It's not a coincidence because Peter's a bigger threat to him. Because Peter was doing more than... Do you think Satan you know, uh, uh, wanted to destroy the disciples just as much as he wanted to destroy the guy that just got saved through Jesus preaching? Of course not. Because they weren't, the man that just got saved wasn't as big of a threat. He wants to get rid of the threat. Number one, I want you to acknowledge there's a, a real battle, a real spiritual war going on. There's a real devil that, that is out there. Number two, I want you to acknowledge personally, yourself, that Satan desires to have you. And your, you, personally, you. Not the guy next to you. Not just, you know, the, uh, somebody sitting in the back. You. He desires to have you. He wants to destroy you. That's what he wants to do. What does that mean? He wants to tear you apart. He wants to devour you. He wants to destroy your Christian life. Point number three, I want you to realize that if you're going to do big things for God, that he's going to desire you even more. He's going to want to destroy you even more. He's going to focus more of his efforts on you. He's going to put his target on you even more often. He's going to spend more time on you and more of his efforts and more of his minions are going to come and afflict you even more often. Now the Bible talks about different devices of Satan. Different things, uh, you know, that Satan does strategies or plans that he utilizes to get an advantage. It tells us here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 verse number 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So he has certain devices. I preached about this a few weeks ago about his subtlety. It's a very dangerous device. It's the most dangerous device I believe that Satan has. Uh, is subtlety. But he has other devices as well. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16 says this, Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So it talks about him, you know, the wicked one, you know, uh, shooting these fiery darts at us. Uh, I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew chapter number 4. Verse number 11 in Ephesians 6 says this, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So notice he has wiles. What are wiles? Wiles are tricks. That's what the word wiles means. It's, it's devices again. It's strategies. Now one of Satan's strategies, if you get to know his personality and his character, and uh, there's a lot in the Bible where you can study him and learn him, about him and know how he is, we can know his devices, just like Paul was able to learn the devices. How did he do that? He learned them by studying the Bible. He learned them, actually in that very chapter is where he mentions the subtlety of Satan of tricking Eve, right? So he has different devices. Another device that Satan has, and this has to do with his inner person of who he is, is that Satan attacks your weaknesses. 
Satan attacks your weaknesses. This is also another military tactic. Uh, you know, uh, this is also another thing that people will do when they're fighting in, in wars. They'll try to find the weakest point. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you know that, that, that armies are, all, are always, you know, analyzing and seeing where the strong points of who they're fighting against are and also where the weak points are. You know, this is why David, when he wanted to, slay, wanted to have Uriah killed, he sent him to the hottest part of the battle. Like he knew where and where he knew that where the stronger men would be, he also references. He knew where the stronger men were. He knew where the strong points of, the, of that particular army was located. And he also knew where the weak points were. And what Satan will try to do is, Satan will try to attack the weak points in your life. He'll try to attack you. He'll, he'll look and try to detect or locate a weakness in your life. And he'll try to attack that. I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 4, verse number 1. It says this, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. So I want you to notice the state that Jesus is in. It says afterwards, after he had, he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, what's it say? Afterward, he was, he was hungry is what that means. Afterward, you know, uh, he, uh, he was afterward and hungered, right? So he was hungry after this time. So notice that he's in a weak state physically, his flesh. Look at verse 3. And when the tempter came, he said, if thou be the Son of God, watch this, command that these stones be made bread. Now, what do you think Jesus in his flesh desired to have the most at this moment? What do you think that he would, want, he would have wanted the most? Food. And you know what Satan knew? Satan, Satan watched Jesus. So you need to keep in mind, he's walking about. He's looking for an opportunity. He was analyzing and he was watching Jesus. He had an eye on Jesus and he saw where he was in his life. He knew the things about Jesus. He knew he was the Son of God. He wasn't you know, not aware of him and where he was. He was well aware. And he watched for him and he looked at him. And then you know what he noticed? He noticed there was a time when Jesus got a little bit weaker physically. Where he had an infirmity. Where he was, he was hungry. And you know what he did? He came in and he attacked the weakness. He came in at the moment where he saw where he had located the weakness and that was the point where he attacked him. You know what he did? He said, hey, you want some bread? You know, he'd been, he'd been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine not eating for 40 days and 40 nights and somebody coming to you and saying, you hungry? Would you like some bread? You know, obviously, I'm pretty sure everybody in here would probably give in, you know. Uh, but of course, this is the Lord Jesus Christ here. But notice what he did. It's very, very important. This is where we learn his character. He went after his weaknesses. He identified the weakness and he went after it. Now, if you look at Peter, I want you to go to John chapter number 21. If you look at Peter... You know, he, he, he warns Peter, he says, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He wanted to tear Peter apart. So if he's going to go after Peter, what's he going to do? He's going to go after his weakness. He's going to try to fe uh, find a weakness, right? He's going to tr try to find a chink in the armor. He's going to try to find an Achilles heel that he can go after. When Satan attacks you, he's going to attack you in places in your life where you're weak. Where you're not as strong as maybe you are in, in, in other uh, areas of your life. You know, I played a lot of basketball growing up. And uh, when we were younger, not in high school, we were in middle school. Every game, what, what basically everybody would do on the court is you would force your opponent while you're playing defense to dribble with their left hand. Now, when you got in high school... It didn't matter as much. You know, people were able to dribble with their left hand just as well almost as they were with the right, most people. But when we were in middle school, that was a tactic that we would use oftentimes. Is what you would do is if, if, if you identified, because the majority are right-handed, if the person was left-handed, you'd force them right. So what you would do is you'd, you, you would come up to that person and you would stand like this is what you would do. So if the person is, is facing me, my left hand is going to be at their right hand. And I would keep a hand out at all times. So you know what they're forced to do constantly? To dribble with their left hand constantly. Now, now, do you think that in a middle schooler that maybe had been playing basketball for one to two years, do you think that they're going to be comfortable dribbling with their left hand? Of course not. So you know the purpose of that? It was to, it was to attack their weakness. And you would keep that hand out. And, and, and you know what they keep wanting to do? 
And I actually had a, another small little tactic that I threw into it where I would put my one hand here stopping them from trying to put the ball into their right hand but I would also keep this hand readily available because you know what I noticed over time is that people kept wanting to go back to their right hand just subconsciously even they knew what I was doing and I was trying to stop them from dribbling with their right hand and I had my hand you know preventing them from dribbling the ball with their right hand they always subconsciously wanted to go back from their left hand to their right hand because it starts to feel uncomfortable you start to kind of feel that discomfort and you know what you do you immediately want to dribble the ball back to that right hand. So what I did was I kept one hand here, but then I kept this hand readily available because I knew where that ball was getting ready to go here in just a few minutes when they started to feel uncomfortable. So I was ready for when the ball was crossed over and then I would just reach and grab the ball each time. Now this is, this is a tactic that takes place in any type of competition and especially in warfare. You know what you do is one person tries to prey on the other person's weakness. You, you identify and you analyze and you find out where their weakness is. So don't be naive tonight and think that Satan doesn't know your strengths and doesn't know your weaknesses. Because he does. He knows in the areas of your life where you're weak. He knows the things in your life that you struggle with and the sins that you've maybe committed in the past. He knows all of the areas, you know, whatever it may be. If you struggle with, you know, coveting, I preached about that recently. If you struggle with envy, if you struggle with laziness, if you struggle with, you know, maybe lusting after the, the opposite gender, whatever it may be, he knows what those are. And do you know what he's going to do? He's going to attack you where you're weak. He's going to attack you, you know, where you're not as strong. He's not going to go after your strengths. He's going to go after your weaknesses. And a lot of times where your weaknesses are, are areas where you struggled in your former life. Areas maybe where you had problems in your, in your former life before you were saved. You know, the old man, the flesh. And, 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 you know, before you had, had put your faith in Christ, whatever you, uh, past you had or the sins that you had of your past, what Satan wants you to do is he wants you to go back to that old life. He wants you to go back to the old man. He wants you to go back to the flesh. So he's aware of what your old life was. He's aware of what you struggled with and what you did in the past. And he knows that these are things that, are, that, that could be considered your vices. Right? Like a vice, it clamps down on you. It gets a hold of you. He knows what your vices are. So what he's going to do is he's going to try to present you with these opportunities more and more. He's going to try to put these things in front of your face and put you into a, a predicament or a circumstance where you're going to be tempted more often with these types of things. I want you to notice that that's exactly what happened to Peter. What Peter ended up doing was Peter went back to his old life. Now, what did Peter do before he started following Jesus? He was a fisherman, right? He was a fisherman. That was his occupation. Peter, of course, uh, you know, Jesus talked about after you were converted. Now, you know, that's not referring to his salvation. That's referring to him repenting within his Christian life because he had done what? He had denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times, didn't he? He had denied him. And what did he say? He said, Satan desired to have you. But after you're converted, what does that imply of when Satan's going to try to attack him and when that's going to take place? When he's going to fall to that? Before he's converted. Well, that conversion of when he starts serving the Lord again takes place in John chapter number 21. And you know what we do is we get, a, we get a, 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 a record of what Peter did when Satan attacked him. And when Satan desired to have him and, and attempted to tear him apart and to sift him as wheat. Sometimes we overlook how impactful the moment was when Peter denied the Lord. This was who he had been following for three and a half years, who he had hung his whole hat on, he had for, you know, uh, you know, his, his past, his life in the past, his occupation, everything, so that he could follow him. And he was with him for three and a half years, and, and he's seeing him being taken away, he's about to be crucified, and he denies him three times and says, I don't even know him. You remember what he does? He, went, he goes away and he weeps bitterly. This was great discouragement to him. This was a great downfall. He was falling apart. Satan was winning. Satan was tearing him apart and destroying him to the point where he was removing him out of the battle. I want you to notice what Simon Peter says in John chapter number 21, verse number 3. It says this, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. Now you see the uh, influence that Peter had on all the other brethren as well. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night, 
they caught nothing. Now, there's so much you can learn from this particular verse alone. But I want you to notice where Satan put Peter at after he'd attacked him. You know what he, you know what he did? You know what he wanted to do? You know where his ta what his tactics led Peter to? Back to his old life. Back to his old, you know, uh, 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 habits is right. what he did. Back to, you know, his old occupation. You know what he wanted? He wanted to remove him out of the ministry. And he wanted to remove him out of serving God. And he knew that if I'm able to, you know, get him to go somewhere, he'll go back fishing. That's where he'll go. Right. He'll go back to his old life or he'll go back to, you know, the things that he did in the past, the things that he loves in the flesh. And if, and if you, yourself, Christian, if you end up falling and Satan ends up attacking you, you know why it's going to be? It's not going to be because of some newfound sin in your life. That's so rare. If you find out about a pastor that ends up falling and he commits some grievous sin, do you know why? And you know what it ends up being? Because it's something that he had committed or, or, or done in the past and he fell back into a sin that he had committed in the past. He fell back into the old man. You know what, you know what they oftentimes do? They go back fishing again. Satan tries to tempt you with the things that you struggled with in the past. He tries to attack your weaknesses. And what he wants to do is he wants to remove you out of the fight. You know what he's going to do? He's going to try to send you back fishing again. He, he wants you to do, you know, he's fine with the recreation. He doesn't want you in the battle. So he's trying to remove Peter out of the fight. And he knows, hey, he'll go fishing. That's what he'll do. So he attacks that weakness. He attacks that weakness. And if you fall out of church, if you fall out of serving God, you know what you'll do? And you know why it'll happen? What will he do? What will he attack? He'll attack a weakness. And you know what you'll do? You'll fall into the flesh. It'll, it'll be, the reason why you'll stop serving the Lord is going to be because of a sin that you've fallen into that you were, that you were involved in in the past. It'll be because of the old man. It'll be because of temptations of the past and things you struggled with in the past. You know what you'll do? You'll go back to your old life. If you're gonna, if you, if you find a man that's zealous in serving God and he stops serving God, do you know where you'll find that guy? Right where he was before he started serving God. He'll go right where he had left off. He'll go back and he'll start fishing again. He'll start committing those same exact sins. That he had in the past. Why? Because Satan kept coming in there and tempting him with his weaknesses. He kept coming in there and he was, and he was tempting him yeah. with his weaknesses. The devil is not sympathetic either. That's another thing that we need to understand. He is pure evil. We're, you know, we're not just you know just just these 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 uh, uh, you know you know just rabbiting wolves walking around trying to tear people apart. So it's it's hard for us not to understand that, or it's hard for us to understand that. Right. But the devil is not sympathetic. He's merciless. He will take advantage of your weakness and he will love it and like it. He'll, he'll be happy that he's successful if he puts you in the gutter or if he's able to you know, cause you to fall into a sin where you end up dying, your wife's a widow, and your children don't grow up to serve God. He would be happy about that. Right. And it's good for us to understand that there's that type of person out there that's wanting to destroy us or to take us yeah, out of the fight. Amen. The devil attacks churches. He tries to turn the congregations against one another. He tries, to, he tries to attack the church because the church is the military base. The church is where everybody gathers together. You know, they get riled up. We get to hear the preaching. We get to hear the, the, the songs. We get in the spirit. We're Amen. singing to one another. You know, uh, these things edify us. And they keep us going throughout the week. So you know what he wants to do is he wants to cut off the pathway to the church. He wants to stop you from going to the church. That's what we see in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. All throughout the New Testament, we see the Bible talking about it and emphasizing the church and the importance of the church. And that's where the edification of the saints takes place. That's where the perfecting of the saints takes place. That's where all the growth takes place. Obviously, there's individual growth, but the purpose of the church is, is to help you grow and to be there for you. Amen. And you know what Satan wants to do is he wants to turn everybody in the church against each other. And you know what he'll do is he'll try to use the sins that maybe people struggle with in the past, and he'll try to turn everybody against each other to try to tear the church apart. And what he does is he sits back, and he pulls out his sniper, and he just picks off one person at a time. You know what his goal is? Is to remove one person out of the fight at a time. Now, how do you think, you know, uh, if you look at 
a military base, you look at a, 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 an army, do you think they're going to be stronger if they're just scattered about all doing their own things? Or do you think they're going to be stronger when they, when they come together, they have weekly meetings, they have a base that they meet at where there's structure, there's organized, there's commands that are being given, they're repeatedly being refreshed with the word of God and being around brethren, that's where you receive encouragement. That's where you receive support. So you know what the devil wants to do? He wants to pick one person at a time off and specifically he wants to get you out of church. Amen. He wants to remove you from church. And you know what he'll do is? He'll, he'll go after one of your weaknesses. Right. And he'll try to use that to try to tear a church apart in order to get somebody out of the church. Even if he gets one person, he's happy. He's not going to be you know, uh, placated with that, but he's pleased. He's going to keep moving on and try to remove one more person out. And get one more person out. Because he knows how powerful the church is. He knows the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Right. You know what he's going to do? He's just going to keep trying to remove people from the church. If he sees a church that's, that's, that's getting many people saved, you know what he's going to do? He's going to get one person out of the fight at a time. He wants you to go back fishing. He wants you to be fishing, you know, on a Sunday morning. That's what he wants. He wants you to be doing out there doing what you want to do. He wants you to be doing anything other than serving God. He wants you out of the fight. You, everybody in here, he wants you out of the fight. He wants everybody, me, he wants all of us. He wants Christians. If you want to serve God with your life, he's going to go after you even harder. He's going to concentrate your efforts even more, his efforts even more so on you. So what do we do? We're going to very quickly end with a conclusion and go back and forth from 1 Peter 5, again, and Luke 22. Now, I don't know if you thought about this, but Luke 22, where we read, get both of those in your hand, please. Luke chapter number 22, and then as I said, 1 Peter chapter number 5. Luke 22 is Jesus speaking. Of course you know that, and he's speaking to Peter. Of course you know that as well, because that was mentioned a few times. Very clearly, he's speaking to Peter. And he's warning Peter in Luke chapter number 22. But I don't know if you thought of the passage that we read in 1 Peter chapter number 5 of who the author is. It's Peter. Right. It's Peter. It's a perfect person to be able to pin down this because you know what he has now? He had been warned and he didn't take appropriate heed to it. And you know what happened was he actually ended up falling victim to it. You know, thank God that he recovered from it and he was converted. A lot of people don't. But you know what he ended up being was the perfect example. And then you know what he knew? He knew the, the wrath of Satan. And he knew the character of Satan. And he actually knew the devices of Satan. Look there again at Luke chapter 22. Look at verse number 31. It says, The Lord said, Simon, Simon. Of course, that's Peter. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now I want to give you a couple of things that you can do. To try to prevent yourself from falling back into that old man and to protect, protect you from the devil. To protect you from Satan. Notice verse number 32. It says this. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail thee, fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So number one, you know what you can do is you can pray. You can pray for yourself that you don't fall into temptation. Actually, in Luke chapter number 22 is, is uh, where Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. And you know what he's doing? He prays. He prays, and he actually tells his disciples to pray, those that come with him, to pray that they fall not into temptation. So you know what we need to do is we need to pray that we don't fall into temptation. Right. We need to pray for a hedge to be put around us like Job, and that God would protect us from the wiles of the devil. But not only that, we need to have strong faith. Now, where do you get faith from? You get faith from the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Do you know what you need to be doing? You need to be praying, number one. And you need to be reading your Bible often, every day. Amen. You need to go out and get your manna every day. You need to read the Word of God. Why? To strengthen your faith. Because Jesus said, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. So in order to protect yourself... From the attacks of the devil, what do you need? Just like Ephesians 6 said. The wiles of the devil, you're, attacked, uh, you're, you're protected how, how from? The wiles of the devil. Shield of faith. From the fiery darts. You need the, the shield of faith. So you need faith. You need prayer. So you need the word of God and you need prayer Amen. to protect you from it. I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter number 5. Verse number 8, he tells us, Be sober, 
Be vigilant. Now that Peter had experienced this, I want you to notice when he says, be sober, be vigilant. What's he saying? He's saying you need to be aware. That's what he's telling you. He's trying to give you personal advice now that he's experienced it. Now he knows how bad that this can be and how he fell into this. He's telling you you need to be aware. And specifically, what you need to be aware of, of I'm sorry, is that you need, to be, you need to be on guard. Be sober, be vigilant. You need to be on guard of your weaknesses. You need to not make provisions for the flesh. You need to not make provisions for the flesh. The areas where you are lacking in your Christianity, the areas maybe where you are lacking or you are weak in your Christian life, and the things that you've struggled with in the past, that's where the devil's going to attack you. Right. If you fall out of church and out of serving God, what you'll go back to are things that you struggled with in the past. The old man hasn't went anywhere. Praise God there is a new man there, but the old man is still there. Yep. And those same temptations, those same uh, you know, fleshly lusts that you struggle with in the past, they're there. And, then, and the devil is going to try to tempt you with those things. Right. So you know what you need to do is you need to be, thirdly, you need to be sober and you need to be vigilant. And specifically, you need to be on guard about your weaknesses. Whatever you struggle with in your Christian life, you know, uh, as far as your character, and with that old man and things that you struggled with in the past, drugs, drunkenness, whatever it may be, lusting, whatever it may be in your particular life, you need to make sure that you take the extra step, you know, further precautions to be very careful and to be sober and to be vigilant. Because you know what the devil's going to do? He's going to try to shoot you in that, that kink in the armor. He's going to try to shoot you in your Achilles heel. That's what he's going to try to do. He's going to locate your weakness, and he's going to attack you in it. Not only is he going to attack you in the problems that you struggle with, but he'll find you in a, in a weak state in your life is what he'll do. He'll find you in a time in your life when you're discouraged. He's merciless. You know what lions love the most? You know what they look for and they just desire? Injured prey. That's what they want. You know, they, they look for something for the weak. They love something that's not fast. They love something that's just easy just to get a hold of and to tear apart. That's what the devil does. As I said, sometimes we can be naive because we're not just evil to the dark to the core. But there are people like that out there, and there is a Satan that, that really truly exists that has these characteristics. And he right. will tear you apart and enjoy every second of it. He will laugh while your life is just in shambles, and you are out of church and you are not serving God, you are not reading your Bible, he would enjoy it and he would love it. Right. So let's go back through the points. Because these points I want to, to, to kind of set into our minds. This is important. And then uh, we're going to close for the evening. Number one, acknowledge that there is a spiritual war, a real spiritual war that is going on. Number two, I want you to understand that Satan desires you. That he desires you. Point number three, I want you to keep in mind that if you plan on serving the Lord with all that you have, with your whole life and doing big things, expect to be in the sights of, of his rifle. Expect to be you know, uh, receiving more concentrated efforts from the devil to destroy your life. Number four, I want you to keep in mind that he's going to be going after your weaknesses. He's going to be going after your weaknesses. So what should we do? Three things. What should we do to, to protect ourselves and to keep ourselves safe? Number one, pray. Number two, read the word of God daily and grow in faith. Number three, be sober and be vigilant. Be awake and be aware. Don't let your guard down. And always, always make sure that you specifically guard the things that you struggle with. Whatever it may be. Whatever those sins are. Because if you fall, and there are so many people out there that nobody would have expected to be out of church. There are so many people out there that nobody expected pastors, that nobody expected to commit grievous sins. There are so many people out there that were just like the best soul winners, the, you know, just the greatest Christians, people that others looked up to. They went back to their old ways and they completely quit serving God. They weren't just the average, regular, moderate people at the church, the great men of God, the great pastors. So often, and you're not immune to it because he desires to have you too. So do you know what they fell back into? They, they, they went back fishing. They went back doing what they were doing in the past. They went back to their old life. You know what you need to do? Thirdly, 
You need to be sober, you need to be vigilant. Specifically, you need to take extra precautions to not make provisions for your flesh and your specific lusts lust that you struggle with. Amen. Let's make sure that we stay in the fight. Let's make sure that we stay steadfast. Let's make sure that we resist the devil and draw nigh to God. Let's make sure that we're not just another soldier, you know, that he just pops off and we're out of the fight. We want to stay in the fight until the day we die. Amen. We want to serve till the day we die. We want to be in the battle and, and fight, you know, the fundamentals of the faith, for the fundamentals of the faith, and stand up. There's so many people that are just out of the fight. Completely removed or, or not a threat any longer. They've liberalized and apostatized, and the devil's just like, well, you guys are a joke. I can move on to the next independent Baptist church. You guys aren't you know, uh, impacting anything. You need to make sure that we stay in the fight and we're making an impact in the fight. Amen. To keep guard on our lives and constantly be, you know, uh, uh, examining ourselves as the Bible commands us. And, and, and we, need to, we need to make sure that we go, if we, if we go back anywhere, you know where you'll go? You'll go back fishing. You'll go back to the old life. Keep a guard on your flesh. And don't allow it to do whatever it wants. You need to watch out for the old man. And uh, let's stay in the fight. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your protection. We thank you for the great examples that we have in the Bible. We thank you for just giving us uh, um, the characteristics of our enemy, dear Lord, and warning us about uh, what he desires and, and, and uh, what his tactics and his devices are so that we can protect ourselves from them. We thank you, dear Lord God, for uh, all of the great examples of those that were attacked but stood back up and kept fighting. We ask you that you would protect our church that you would guide us with your Holy Spirit, that you would do whatever on your side necessary, dear Lord God, to keep us in the fight. We love you so much.